Well, thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. It's always fun to be back at West Lebanon Supply. Um, I, I left last June to retire so I could become a full-time sugarer and hopefully learn some new things. So tonight what I'd like to do is I have some slides to go through. I have lots of show and tell things up here. And at the end, I have some pictures of some actual backyard sugaring. And I also have some pictures of the sugar house I built this summer after I retired. I built a post and bean sugar house and cut the lumber myself and all that crazy stuff. So um, without further ado, we'll get started. So um, anybody doesn't have a handout at the end, just let us know. We'll try to make you another one. We're a little short, but we'll make some more. So it is how to make maple syrup backyard sugaring. So it's not for big producers. So before I get started um, too far into this, to give me an idea. How many are going to have, say, 50 taps or more? You are. OK. Do you already have that many? We do. We have a few hundred taps. You have a few hundred? OK, then you should be up here teaching the course. <laughs> Um, how about everybody else? You're around 10, 25, something like that? Okay. So you can stop me as you go through, if we go through this, if you want to ask questions, or we can wait to the end. Um, I'm, I'm open either way. Just throw something at me when I'm talking. I'm, I can talk about cheering all night. So um, sometimes I need to stop. So what you need to do is you need to gather all the things that you need to do your process with um, you got to think about how much you want to make that's one reason I was asking those questions um, and then most of all it's it's fun it's work but it's fun and I'm sure that once you get started doing it you'll agree that it's, it's a lot of fun even though it's a lot of work um, what you need to do first of all is to identify your trees it is easier to do when the leaves are on, but still, it's not hard to do when the leaves are not on. The most predominant type of maple tree that we have is the sugar maple. Um, and then after that is the red. We basically in this area only have sugars and reds. The red maples are just in certain areas. I personally don't have any red maples, but I know some people that do. And of course, the sugar maples give the most sap and the sweetest sap. However, all the maples can be tapped. Um, I was talking with some folks earlier, they, they have the red maples and they made maple syrup from them last year. I happen to have a silver maple in my, my yard. My dad planted was five years old. I have never tapped it and I will never tap it. I'm just trying to keep the tree healthy to survive. I'm not sure how they would be to tap and make maple syrup from. Um, maybe some of you know that you can make syrup from birch, white birch. There are some producers in Vermont that actually make uh, sap from white birch. It does take 100 gallons of sap roughly to make one gallon of syrup. So I did have a customer once that promised me um, a taste sample. I never did get it. Um, I would I am a little curious as what it tastes like but I think I'll probably stick with the maple um, so how, how to identify the type of, of maple well there's several different ways like I said the leaves are the easiest way the bark is one way the sugar maple maple is pretty classic when it's young it's usually pretty smooth that one is not so young so the the bark tends to get gray, more variegated, just like this piece here, which is sugar maple. Um, there's a typical bud. Uh, I think I got some pictures of some leaves in here too. There we go. Uh, you got the helicopter buds. They're, they're opposite each other. Um, I don't have any pictures. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. To distinguish between the sugar maple and the red maple, because those are the two most kind we have you'll notice that the red maple has like little saw tooth all the way around it and in addition to that when the leaves turn color in the fall they're bright bright red 
Um, maybe that's why they call them red maples. I'm not sure where it got its name. So <clears throat> the trees need to be of sufficient size to be tapped. Basically, I'll show you an exclusion to this as we go through the show, but basically you like them to be a minimum of 12 inches in diameter. And this is a nice thing to do to have the greatest exposure to the sunlight. Um, we all don't have that luxury. Not all of them have, you know, the best exposure. Sometimes we have to tap them still. And you want to have trees that are healthy. If you have trees that have a lot of broken limbs, particularly big limbs, it's probably not as healthy of a tree. So our goal is to keep our trees healthy. We want to respect the trees for giving us the sap. We'll talk more about how to do that as we go through. So basically, here's all the equipment, basic equipment that you're going to need. So if you're, if you're doing, how many are doing this for the first time? Okay. So a couple things you need to think about is how are you going to boil it down? Are you going to build a fire pit? Are you going to use like a camp stove, a gas camp stove, um, or maybe some other method uh, versus buying an evaporator? Because I'm assuming for the first, if you're doing it for the first time, you're not going to buy an evaporator out of the chute until you get going. But you can use some pretty basic equipment. The one thing I will say, I would discourage you from boiling it in the house. It can make a mess. And by that, I mean, you're evaporating all that water and it has sugar in it. So anything it hits and touches on is going to be sticky. However, having said that, I do recommend that you bring it in the house to finish it when it gets close to being finished because you'll have more control over it. Uh, basically, there are two, two different size taps, files, whatever you want to call them. One is a 5 sixteenths, and the other classic one is a 7 sixteenths. And I'll talk a little bit about the two different sizes and, and the one I prefer, the one I actually use, and why. Um, the vegetable oil is your defoaming agent. You can use vegetable oil, you can use butter. They make a commercial defoaming agent, but vegetable oil works fine. When you're boiling, it has a tendency to want to froth up and boil over. So you need something to, to combat that. And that's what the vegetable oil is for. And you need a way to know when it's served. I had a customer, it was a salesman came in here a few years ago and he'd started sugaring. So I started having a conversation with him. I was curious how he knew when it was served. He said, well, that's easy. You can tell it boils differently. It does. It smells different and looks different. And that's not how you can tell when it's served. Um, you have to be a little bit closer than that. So there's a couple things you can do. One, the basic way is to have a candy thermometer. That, that's got a large enough scale so it will go up high enough for you. It's pretty inexpensive. My preference is to have a digital read thermometer. It allows you to pay attention to what you're doing. You're not always trying to figure out what the temperature is. And also, this you can set, um, uh, not a timer, but uh, you can set a temperature so it'll beep when it gets close. So it'll tell you, you don't have to worry about boiling too much or burning it. The other way is with a hydrometer. And anybody that sugars, obviously you guys use a hydrometer, right? But to use a hydrometer, you have to have a test cup to put your syrup in and then this goes in there. But if you're only making like a cup of syrup or a smaller quantity than that, this isn't gonna work for you. So you're gonna have to rely on the temperature. And it can be very accurate. And we'll talk about how you, you do that as we go through. Clean equipment, uh, this, is just, this is just essential. Just remember, we're making a food product, so everything wants to be clean. What I suggest 
if you're buying like let's say you're gonna buy some buckets and spouts here before I would use them I would clean them just like you would at the end of the season before you start for next season and to do that you just take 20 uh, 20 parts of water to one part of household uh, bleach and and use that as your cleaning agent I would soak the spouts in it for a period of time. It helps to kill the bacteria. Um, except for your filters, you do not want to wash the filters. All your other equipment you want to wash. So, weather conditions are important to know when to tap your trees. Historically, we used to tap the trees around town meeting, but in the last few years, as we all know, um, our weather patterns have changed. <coughs> like today, it was like 40 degrees out. Um, and there's a storm coming this weekend. It's supposed to get a little bit colder. Last year, <clears throat> I had my trees tapped in February, and I was collecting sap in February, uh, about the second week in February. I'm looking at doing that again this year, but um, this weekend, I'm going to look at the long range forecast before I really decide I'm going to do that. Um, you usually have a certain window, and part of the window is predicated by how long the tap is going to stay good. In other words, a tap is going to dry up after a while, no matter what the weather is. So it'll give you so much sap. So it's, it's kind of a guess gamble as to when you're going to have the best weather to collect the most sap. Usually you can collect the sap until the trees start budding. When it, you're gonna know when the trees start budding. Red maples, you're gonna see them first because you look up on the hillside, it's gonna be red. The sap will be, has a tendency to be yellow. If the sap's yellow, it's gonna have an off flavor, bitter flavor, you all throw it away. Or it's gonna be really milky, mucusy, and it just is awful looking stuff. When it gets to that point, I stop. I do know people that still make syrup out of it, but it's a lot harder to make, it's harder to filter, and it's usually a darker syrup for cooking. But you'll know when you get to the end, the, the sap will tell you. Okay, here we go on tapping the trees. This is um, a good guideline to follow. Just start with the 12 inch diameter. Um, if it's, uh, you can put two taps in if it's greater than 18. The most taps you're allowed to put in is three. And that's usually if it's over 27 inches. And how I do that, I don't take a tape measure. I give it a hug like this. And if I can't touch my fingers, maybe I'll think about putting three taps in if it's a healthy tree. Um, and you have to take things into consideration like broken branches and scars and kind of try to assess the health of the tree a little bit. Um, this is kind of a rule of thumb. Now I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit of variation from that. If you, how many of you live in Vermont? Like me, okay. We have what's called a land use program in Vermont where you can put your land in land use. As I, I know New Hampshire has a, a similar program. But if you live in Vermont and have your land in land use, this is their tap and guideline. It's a little bit different because they differentiate between using a 5 16 spout and a 7 16. Using a 5 16 is more liberal. You can start tapping the tree when it's 10 inches in diameter and it's over 22 in diameter, you can put three. However, if you go over to the column with the 7 16, they don't, not, they don't allow you to put three taps in a tree. Um, I'll stop here a little bit because uh, a lot of people will ask, well, don't you get more sap with the 7 sixteenths and 5 sixteenths? The answer is maybe a little bit, but probably not much because they have done studies on it that shows you get almost the same quantity of sap from a 5 sixteenths as you do a 7 sixteenths. Now, the, the beauty of that is the 5 sixteenths has one half the surface area of the 7 sixteenths. Because of that, a tree heals up a lot faster. And that's, we, we want to keep the trees healthy. So that's the reason for that. 
Um, I, for, I forgot to mention something at the, at the beginning that's not part of the slideshow. It's, it's about how the sap flows in the tree. Does everybody know the concept of how that works? So it, it has to freeze at night, get below freezing. It starts freezing at the very bud tips. If you were to put a vacuum gauge in the tree, the tree goes under a vacuum and it draws the sap up from the roots in the ground. And the next day when the sun comes out or it warms up above freezing, the very outer buds thaw out first and the, in, the tree goes under a pressure inside. If you were put, it, put a gauge on it, it would be under pressure. Where at night it's under vacuum and at daytime it's under pressure. This is how we get sap out of a tree because it's under pressure and it gives us that sap. Um, I got this piece of wood. You're welcome to come up and look at it afterwards. But this is probably, this is an old, old piece of wood. That's probably a 7 16 tap hole. But what happens, this shows you that the sap flows up and down in the tree. But, but this is the scar. It's just like us if we get a cut. This is the scar that it leaves. It actually encap encapsulates itself around where the sap flowed and came out here. And it flows in both directions. It, it'll be above the tap as well as below it. What happens is that wood that's encapsulated will never ever flow sap again. That's, that's it. That's all done in that part of the tree. And as the tree grows, the growth rings will continue to grow outside of that tap hole. So consequently, that's why we move the taps around from year to year. You never tap in the same location again. And if you do, you won't get sap or you'll get very little. So this is a, this is a good, it shows you pretty well. If you use the 5 16 taps, the scarring will be smaller, yeah, where it encapsulates itself. Yeah, go ahead. Do, we, do I see, right around, you see like large operations where the hose is from tree to tree? Yep. Are they leaving the taps in all year though? No, no. You might, you might see them in the trees earlier than you would if you put the spouts and buckets in, but it's usually because they have so many trees to tap they have to get it tapped so when we start sugaring season. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking that because once you get to the end of the sugaring season, first thing you want to do, you want to pull your taps immediately. Don't, don't leave them in the tree. As soon as the season's over, pull them out because you want the tree to start healing. I, I, I've seen people, I know somebody that still has taps in the tree from last year and never pulled them out. And I, when I see them, it drives me crazy. Go ahead. So if 5 sixteenths and 7 sixteenths are similar how much uh, sap you get and 5 sixteenths do less damage, why do you prefer 7 sixteenths? I don't prefer oh, 7 sixteenths. I prefer the 5 sixteenths. Oh, okay. Yeah. But if, if you're only going to hang out 5, 10 buckets in your backyard, um, the 7 sixteenths is fine. But I, I got a larger operation and so I prefer the 5 sixteenths. So the height that you tap the tree at is, is your preference. You know, years ago, we used to have three feet of snow. And you'd tap it, it down here, and at the end of the season, the buckets would be up here. You, you're still gonna get the same amount of sap no matter where, where in the height-wise that you tap the tree. Um, I had a customer once who lived in Hanover near Dartmouth College, and he told me that he tapped the tree way up high and he had to use a step ladder to gather the sap because the students tried to vandalize his, his buckets. But he still got sap. <coughs> so the, the rule of thumb is from year to year, you always move your taps and you can set up your own kind of system where you can tap on one side one year and maybe the next side yet next year. But at a minimum, you want to go horizontally six inches from where the old tap was and vertically you want to go at least two inches. So you could keep a tap over itself provided you separated it by about two feet if you want to do that. And it goes without saying, um, you want to use the same drill size as the bit size that you're using. I had a customer that had a problem with that once and so I started asking, they weren't using the proper bit size. So 
If you're using a 716 uh, spile, then you want to use a 716 inch bit. And same, same for the uh, 516. Okay, Would, has anybody here not tapped a tree? Okay, I was gonna tap this thing to give you an idea how you do it. It's only gonna take a couple minutes. Um, it's based on this premise here. Um, you can use, you can use a little bit and brace. That's what they used to use. Most people have electric um, drills in their home. That's what's used. Even professional sugarers use that. And that's what I brought tonight. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it and show you real quickly. Um, I have a, a special tapping bit. Because um, I drill so many trees. But as you can see, I use just a regular drill. So like it says, you point it upward just a little bit. That is not so you get more sap. That is so that spout drains because you don't want it to go the other way to drain sap back into the tree because it will just induce more bacteria into the tree. So what you do is you just pick a good place and you just go on a slight angle. I brought my sharper tip. And what I do is I use a piece of tape to mark how deep it is. For a 5 16 it's an inch and a half. For a 7 16 it's two and a half inches. And then what you do next, before you put the spout in, let's say you got some sawdust there. Whatever you do, don't blow into it. What happens when you blow into it? You, you induce a lot of bacteria. So the tree's gonna shut down sooner. So. The idea is that's why I was saying you should disinfect these spouts before you put them in. So a good thing to use is you know like a coffee stirrer. Um, you got a little bit, of, a little bit of crud there. You can just pull it out of the way, and then you put the put this in. I didn't drill a very good hole. There. So then you put your spout in like that. And then what I do to put it in, I use a little bit softer faced hammer. You can use a mechanics uh, um, hammer too. I don't like to use a big nail framing hammer just because of the size of it. It, it can be metal. So what you do when you, when you hit on this thing, I've got a process when I put them in, I usually only hit them three times. Once you've done a few, once you get to the third one, it sounds different. The worst thing you can do is put these in too tight. If the tree's frozen, you can split the tree. Actually, they'll split it above and below, and it does significant, significant damage to the tree. Um, and it's hard for the tree to repair itself. Whereas for a tree to heal up this hole, it's pretty, pretty easy for it to do. So I just tell people, when you put them in, don't put them in too tight. If you come out someday and the spell's pulled and the bucket's on the ground, it's no problem. You can always go and put it back in. Whereas if you put it in too tight, you can't reverse what you've done. Anybody's welcome to come up afterwards if you want to try it too. So light brown shavings, you know, white, light brown. You can see on there, that means it's healthy. Dark brown means either you found an unhealthy spot in the tree or you've drilled into this spot that I was talking about before. So if you find dark brown shavings like that, you need to drill a different hole. And the other thing is, once you've gone through the season and let's say you've got a couple trees or whatever that you don't think are running very good, don't go re-drill a hole. You, you drill a hole once for one season. Um, you'll just drill a different hole next year somewhere else. So you never re-tap an existing hole. Okay, we, we talked pretty much about this, how to, how to put it in. Um, and you can see, because of the shape of that spout, and it's on an upward slant a little bit, that the sap is going to drip off it. 
Then you just hang the buckets. It's nice if you put a lid on it. If you can, it keeps uh, external garbage out of it, um, rain, what have you. And you will get, you will get bark and stuff off the tree too. So then, then you need to collect it. You should collect your sap daily um, and you filter out stuff. You can use cheesecloth for filtering. Um, or you can use one of the, I use one of these kind of filters. It's just for filtering. Uh, it does a very good job. Um, as it says, you discard yellow cloudy sap, obviously. If you get a bucket and it's got a little bit of frozen stuff, you can just throw the frozen stuff away because that's basically water. You've concentrated the sap that's in it. Some people that are purists say, I'm not throwing the sugar away, so you don't want to, but you're not gonna get much sweetness from it. So here's just kind of a, a, a guideline about one tap. You might get a gallon per run. That's a, that's a really good run. The rule of thumb that I use to use, I think about maybe getting a quart of syrup per tap. Of course, there are a lot of variables in the weather that come into play. Um, syrup is roughly a ratio of four to one. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. That depends on the sweetness. That means it takes 40 gallons of sap to make a, a gallon of syrup. And sap is, is uh, doesn't keep very well at all. It's a lot like milk. So it's nice if you can boil it every day, or if you only have a few buckets, or your schedule doesn't permit, or you don't get much uh, a particular day. You can store it. There's different ways you can store it. You got room, you can put it in your refrigerator, or you can use snow to pack around it outside to keep it cold. You wanna keep it below 38 degrees if you can. Don't go longer than seven days. Seven days is really the limit. You can freeze it too. I, I've never seen anybody do that, but you can freeze it and then of course it keep. So once you come to boiling, once you've got your, your boiling container, then and you've figured out how what you're gonna use for a fire, the sap, you're gonna fill it up, you're gonna get it hot, you're gonna start boiling it. What you really should do is check the boil temperature of it because that's your ground zero that you're gonna work from to determine when, when it's served. Uh, a nice way to boil is put enough in so you're comfortable with it, but I like to get to a point where it can boil down around maybe two inches or so, but I wouldn't do that if you've never done it to start with because it's easy to burn the pan. Um, it, and it'll keep, <coughs> excuse me, It'll keep evaporating, so you need to keep adding syrup to it as you go, I mean, sap to it as you go along if you've got a lot to boil. I personally like larger open pans. They sell these at West Lebanon Supply. These are stainless steel. So I like them for small operation because it's got a lot large surface area, so it'll boil faster. I also like the depth because as I said earlier, sap tends to boil over. And it'll more so tend to boil over once it gets closer to syrup. So I like having the depth in the pan. If you don't stir it as you're boiling it, um, it, it kind of takes care of itself in that regard. So it starts getting close to syrup when it gets close to 218 degrees. And a couple more slides here, I'll, I'll tell you why that temperature is critical. And the other thing is you use a defoamer as you need to. Once that starts to, looks like it's gonna foam up, use a defoamer, it rather be butter, vegetable, or, or whatever you've chosen. They do make cursed, um, commercial defoamers too, but vegetable oil works well. Just any fat? You uh, can use fat. You can, bacon fat works really good. However, if you're selling it, you shouldn't do that. They frown on that. But if you're making it for yourself, yes. And I, I've personally done it, I've seen it done. I know somebody that stretches a piece of bacon up there and lets the bacon fat drip in. It works. <laughs> okay, so here we, here we go. So 
I would suggest if you're boiling it outside, I highly recommend that you finish it inside. It gives you more control over the heat and what's going on. Once you get comfortable, if you want to, you can boil it outside. I mean, finish it outside. Did you finish it outside? No. You finish, finish it in the house, okay. It gives you more control. Um, and it's, it's syrup when it's seven and a half degrees above the boiling point of water. What's the boiling point of water? What's that? Okay, where? Water boils at 212 degrees at sea level. So we're, we're all above sea level and at certain atmospheric conditions. Now our, our atmospheric conditions change constantly every day. So once you get it to the point of where it's getting close to syrup, if you're gonna bring it in the house, a nice thing to do is take a pot beside it and boil it with water. Record that temperature and then add 7.5 degrees to it. And that, when it gets to that temperature, which is gonna be around 219 degrees, it'll be perfect syrup if you're using a thermometer. If you're using a hydrometer, uh, it's gonna be at 67 degrees bricks, if it's at 219 degrees. And of course, the density varies the temperature. So if you go into a, a sugar house and you watch a sugarer, you'll see them take a test cup like this, take the hot syrup and then they'll put their hydrometer in it and it's got a red line on it. Do you ever see them check the temperature of it? It's not necessarily 211 degrees. So this hydrometer is calibrated at 211 degrees. So in theory, it's got two red marks on it. One is the hot test, but that's calibrated for 211 degrees. And the other is the cold test, which is 60 degrees. And at 60 degrees, it's gonna be 67 degrees bricks. A German inventor in the 1800s developed this scale and it's for uh, sugars that are in solution. So it's basically 67% sugar, basically what it is. And that's what they use for a scale. This is a, ver a pretty nice hydrometer because inside the package, it comes with a, a correction scale based on what the temperature of your syrup is. So what you do is you look at that scale and it'll tell you what it's supposed to be at a certain temperature. So to do it this way, do it correct. Yes, you need a thermometer and you need the hydrometer. However, this is mine, the young couple designed this test cup which has got the thermometer already in it but it's got the brick scale on it so what what you do is you have to match when it's at the right bricks on your hydrometer when you stick it in here it'll compensate for the temperature they have to agree with each other so this means you don't have to check the temperature of it separately you're welcome to come up and look at it afterwards So once you, once you get it to the point of being served, um, turn the heat off, obviously, cover it up immediately because it'll continue to evaporate from the heat. So you, it's easy to overshoot it. I've had conversations with what I was talking about. The sugar is not checking the temperature. My church man was by last week checking my new sugar house and he's a sugarer. And he said his, his syrup is always on the heavy side. So I asked him about the temperature thing. He kind of gave me that blank stare. That's usually why. Usually what happens is, if you don't compensate it for the temperature, it's probably gonna be on the heavy side. Um, just to point something out here, it's supposed to be, in Vermont, New Hampshire, it's 67 degrees bricks. In Canada, it's 66 degrees bricks. I don't know why. I, I think here in New England, we like to have a little bit of a safety factor, plus, being, being from this area, I think we make better syrup anyway. So it just makes, it helps us make better syrup. There we go, talking about the thermometer versus the hydrometer. Just, you know, some pictures of how it works. And there's the hydrometer, the red line on it. And he's checking to see if it's, if it's where it should be. So here's a part that 
I like to talk about and do the least. I just think this is the, the yuckiest part of sheer group is filtering it. So I've done tons of reading. I, I've tried to learn all I can about some tips, tips and techniques to make it easier to filter. So the first question I'm gonna throw out, why do, you, why do you even filter it? Anybody know? Why would you filter, sir? I know you guys know. Anybody? What's that? That's right, but why do you need to get it out? It's, it's kind of a, a byproduct, but it doesn't hurt you. And, and it's, only, it's purely for looks. That's, that's why we filter syrup, it's for looks. Because you've gone to all this work to make some, you put it in a mason jar, you have some friends come over and see that niter in the bottom. Somebody goes, ew, what's that? So. What is niter? Niter is a byproduct of boiling. It's, if you look at what sap is composed of, what is sap composed of? What are the three ingredients in sap? I forgot to ask that question. Water's the big one. You know, around 98%, what else? Who, who said that? Sugar and sauce. Sugar, sucrose, and what else did you say? Minerals. Minerals, yes. It's got about 0.1% minerals. And during the boiling process, those minerals condense, and then some of the fallout from it is nitrate. So they come from the minerals, and that's what gives it its distinct flavor, and the syrup will taste different depending mm -hmm. upon where it comes from. Um, it'll taste different from year to year, too. Depends on the minerals in the ground where the trees are. So all, the only reason we filter it is just to get the niter out. No one has developed a use for niter yet, which I find fascinating. So the easiest thing to do is to not even filter it. And I know people that don't, that make it for their own consumption. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you're making a little bit, it's a pain to fil filter a cup. If you're making a cup at a time, it, it's a pain. You're gonna lose half of it in the filter. So a couple things you can do. You can make your syrup as you go along through the season, pour it into a container, whether it be a, a, you know, a gallon mason jar or what have you. And when you pour it in there hot, you get up the next morning, you're gonna see a little bit of niter on the bottom. So as you continue to make syrup, it'll all settle to the bottom. When you get to a certain point in the, in the year, whether it be at the end or part way through, you got a big jug of syrup and you want to filter it, that's the time to filter it all at one time. It makes it a whole lot easier than trying to filter a little bit here and a little bit there. And when you filter, you need to wet the filter um, because if you don't wet the filter, it's going to drink a lot of the syrup and you're not going to recoup it. So what you should wet it with you just stick it in, you can use hot sap, you can use cold sap, and hang it up and just let it drip while you're boiling. And so that way it's already got, got the sap in it. Use pre-filters. You can use, depending on the quantity, two or three of these to stick in here. And as it gets filled up, you just pull these out. Um, and as you're filtering it, whatever you do, don't squeeze this. If you squeeze it at all, You'll get, you'll get some niter through there. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of an easier way to filter it, is to do it that way. Um, and then what you can do is, if you have not canned it when you've made it, you can go back and re, you need to heat it to can it to a certain temperature so it seals the container. That's the temperature it needs to be at to can it. 185 to 190. So let's let's say you got a big container of syrup and you've not canned it, but you want to go back and can it. You can warm it up, but you have to use a thermometer and don't go over 190 degrees. If you stay under 190 degrees, you will not have to refilter. If you go over 190 degrees, you'll need to refilter it because more niter will precipitate. So that's a good temperature for a canning. <coughs> and syrup freezes well too. I've never, I guess I have frozen syrup once. Um, 
So I, I'm, uh, something I forgot to mention. So as you're boiling, let's say you take some syrup off, you filter, you do whatever you do with it, and all of a sudden you realize it's it's over what it should be. What you can do is to bring it back, you can add sap to it. Now if it's under, you just boil it some more. So it's, it's easy to correct to get it to the right density. What happens if the density is too high, and most of you may have had this happen, you buy syrup from someone, if it sits on, you know, you don't use it up for a while, you'll get crystallization in the bottom, and that's from being over the 67 degrees brick. What will happen if it's not, if it's under, mm -hmm. it'll probably grow a little bit of mold on it. That's really harmless. You can heat it up and skim it off. The worst thing that can happen is if it's under too much and it's got too much bacteria, it'll grow bacteria all through the syrup. I've only seen a picture of it and it was not very nice looking. It certainly was not, not consumable. So cleaning up is just basically hot water for your filters. You want to use hot water and rinse them. Um, and triple rinse them. What I do when, when I take a filter like, like this and I'm, I'm cleaning it, you rinse it and rinse it and rinse it. And you can go like this just to lightly squeeze it. Whatever you do, don't twist it. It breaks the fibers in here and then the filters don't work as good. So if you can lightly squeeze, that's good. Um, when you're filtering sap with one of these, when you get done, say, oh, this still got some syrup in there. I'm not gonna get any out of it. What you can do is go over, take this, dip it in either hot sap or if you got more syrup, dip it in there and you'll get the sweetness of this to go in your next batch. If you're a purist and you wanna preserve, get all the sweetness out of it that you can. I just, I, I put a, some slides up here for treats. Uh, never personally done this, but sugar on snow is pretty easy. You know, all you do is you just boil it beyond maple syrup and it makes it thicker and it makes it like taffy-like. Um, this is maple cream. They use, they make machines to make this, but this is 235 degrees. But the thing about it is you gotta take it off and put it in an ice bath and when it gets down to 100 degrees, you gotta stir it like for half an hour. So to make it by hand, I really like maple cream, but it looks like a lot of work to make it. I don't think I'm ever gonna try to do this by hand. I think I'll, I'll probably opt to buy it instead. Um, and I got the maple candy recipe. That's taking it up to a little bit higher temperature. You still gotta cool it. Well, you just don't stir it as much but it does get a lot thicker so you got to stop stirring at the right time so you can pour it into mold and for resources all the staff here at West Up Supplies more than willing and happy to help you any questions you have I'm more than happy if anybody wants to come up I'll be happy to give you my email address they all have my contact information here uh, I enjoy helping people and I enjoy obviously talking about it. There are two good, most of the information we've gotten to do these in the UNH, uh, the Cooperative Extension has good information. The University of Vermont calls it, there's the their Vermont Proctor Maple Research Center. There's lots and lots of information. They do a lot of research. If there's any phase of it you're interested in, tons of information. There's uh, two forums out there. One of them being Maple Trader, you can go on there and search, and there's maple producers everywhere. People just like to help each other out. You can search topics. You can sign up and become a member, which I have. It's free. Um, and it's just a great resource. And most importantly, how many of you have ever gone to open houses, a maple sugar and open house, to visit a sugar house? Great. Awesome. So each year, both estates have what they call an open weekend where people are invited to come and visit sugar houses in operation, hopefully. Usually they're the same weekend, and this year they are, March 21st and 22nd. Um, we just hope that we have good sugar weather. I've, I've been, I think it was last year, 
they weren't boiled because the weather was so funky. But they still invite you to come. And you can, every sugar house you go to is going to be different how they do it, the process, and the size of it. So what I'm, what I'm going to do, I've got some personal slides. I'm going to show the, a, a backyard operation, which I got involved with with my son a couple of years ago. So I'll just show them to you quickly. He, he had a pan he borrowed from a friend and he made the, the base out of cement blocks, but he put a pipe on the back and insulated it so it would draw well and, you know, stuffed it so it got a good draw. Uh, I was amazed at how well it worked. I mean, that you could stand around it, but it was putting the heat up into the pan. It worked uh, incredibly well. Oh, um, you see the pot on the back? That's our warming pot. That's got sap in it. So we would just let that there get take the heat and get the sap. This was a, a continuous draw off method. It's got four baffles in it. So you pour it in slowly on the back end. And when it got near sir, we take it off on this side. So that's a continuous process method, like, like a bigger rig in a sugar house would be instead of just doing one batch at a time. Uh, just another picture of it. So we, we tried to take all the pots and stuff to keep it warm. Um, eventually I set up a barrel stove, you can see it in the back. So we had two rigs going. As we made three gallons that day, but it took us 11 hours, but it, it was a lot of fun. So if you're outside working, you got to have food. So a friend of ours, he made a mustard marinade and put brat, uh, bratwurst in it, and we cooked them outside the fire. And of course, you got to feed the help, and that made, <laughs> keeps everybody happy and just have a really good time. The only thing that happened on this, we had a couple mm -hmm. nylon parkers that got a little melted from the pipe because that pipe got pretty hot. My wife being one of them. So here we are. This is a different pan. This is one of these pans. What we did is we made the toffers a little bit smaller and we're finishing it in this. So we've got it boiled down to a certain point where it needs to be finished and we opted to do it all outside. So there we are filtering it. You can see the the, the liner inside the filter. The filter was soaked in sap, and we're pouring the good stuff through it. And there's the barrel stove. Had the frame made on it, so it accepts those pans. I have to say, the, the, the bricked arch, I think, worked much better, but I think part of it's because it had a, a lot of open surface area. This got so hot, you couldn't even stand beside it. It just radiated the heat, um, but it did work. We just had fun burning up a lot of wood. Um, I think I missed the picture because here, um, what we did to tell when that was served, that is a digital thermometer. And what I did is I kept an eye on it. So I used that to determine when it was served. Um, I didn't use a hydrometer. I did it all by temperature. And, and it made some pretty good syrup. So I do, have, I do have one other quick slide show that I'd very much like to show you. So I retired to West Southern Supply this last year. And one of the reasons I retired because I ha I've had this dream for quite a few years to build a sugar house. And so I was able to do that. And I'll show you a few slides and show you how I got carried away doing it. We cut the trees about two years ago. I cut the trees off my land. My neighbor has a sawmill. So we cut the trees, we got them out, we sawed the lumber. And then my son, I have twin sons. They're both teachers, ironically. 
and one of them said, hey, Dad, we should make a post and beam. And I was thinking, post and beam, but I'm going to use mechanical fasteners. He said, no, no, we do it the old-fashioned way with the mortise and tenons. And so he said, do you know how to do that? And he said, no. But he said, we could learn together. And so he just, I said, okay, let's go for it. So we made the old-fashioned mortise and tenon joints. So every piece has to be laid out and cut joints by hand. I think, Jim, you came up one day when I was chiseling away. I did a lot of chiseling. So we got the first corner post. It's, it's, got, a, it's got a tenon on the bottom. So we got excited. We got to make sure it fits. So we had to put it up and say, well, the first post fits. So we kept going. It's basically three bays. They're called bents. So there are two of them. You put those together on the ground and make them nice and square. And then you go and put them up there with the tenons on the bottom and you keep your fingers crossed and hope and pray it all fits together. So then what you have to do is all the pegs where you're gonna put siding on the outside, the pegs that are gonna be put in from the outside, you have to put those in before you put the siding on. Uh, there's a picture with with all three of the vents in place and the top plate. That top plate is a six by six and it's 22 feet long. And you can see all the little notches in it. That's where the rafters sit in it. I, I cut all those out by hand. And there's <clears throat> the rafters starting to go up. The way this is designed, you don't have to have collar ties. Um, there's some more of them. You can, that little notch is in the end, is like a Z-shaped thing. It sits in there, and then there's a peg that goes down through the top, so that can never come apart. So it eliminates the necessity of having to have collar ties. So it's all open inside. So my, my two twin sons, they're rock climbers, so I let them stay on the roof, and they, they just had a great time. I just couldn't feed them wood fast enough to put the roof on. And so this guy, he likes to make everything fun to have a good time. So we, we all have, have a good time, even though we're working. And happened to capture this picture after a rainstorm, starting to build the cupola. My dream was to at least get the roof on this year. So we did do that. And there's the arch I bought used. I actually rebuilt the inside of it and it's got all stainless steel sitting there waiting for sap patiently waiting to sugar and i'm very excited i can't wait um, there's a picture of the finished sugar house um, so that's that's what i did after i retired now i'm waiting to sugar. Nice. so i'd like to stop there and thank all of you and just ask if anybody would like to ask questions uh, Shoot them out there. If not, I'm certainly going to stay here a little bit, picking up. I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. I have a question. Yeah. So, I mean, I I sealed mine in mason jars last year, heated, and then the way of sealing in the mason jar. So, those, the, the sap bottles that are over there with the white caps. Mm -hmm. So if I was, wanted to use one of those and I filled it with hot syrup, mm -hmm. if I just screw the top on, does it automatically seal? Wait, I've wait. never used them and I don't okay. know. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll pull it out. You're talking about these. Guys. Yeah, just one of the little jugs. With, yeah, one of those. Either that. Say I wanted to set. She wants to know. Do a couple for gifts. She wants to know kind of how to seal them up. Yeah. The answer to your question is yes, but you put the hot syrup in and lay it on its side so that it covers this. Yep. Okay. And that will help it seal. Mm -hmm. You should do that with the masonry jars too. Yes. Yeah, good question. Okay, so that I'm just throwing on tight and heat it. Put it on side and it, your, it, should, your, your, it okay. should seal up. Okay, great. And the same works with the, with the plastic jugs too? Mm -hmm. I was, yes, you always you always lay these it's on the side. There's a different yeah, I like plastic jug. Yeah. Um, you know, once you fill them with the 185, 190 degree syrup, you screw it on. This is the yeah. same type of cap. You lay it on the side. The reason I brought one of these up, how, how many are going to sell syrup? Anybody going to sell syrup here? Okay. So in both Vobot and New Hampshire, the, the rules are pretty much the same. 
you got to have a container that tells you what's in it, the quantity, and then what you're going to have to do, one thing I didn't talk about was grading the syrup. It has to be graded and the grade label has to be on it. In addition to that, it has to have your name and your address on it so that anybody picks one of these up, you know what's in it and who made it. That's, that's a requirement. Um, there, are, there is a grading kit up here, but if you're making your own, you don't need to grade it. Some people like to know what their syrup is, so you can do that if you, if you want to. But the only requirement to grade it is if, if you're selling it, basically. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Come on up. You're welcome to come up to look at some of this stuff up here. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.